Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode four of Ask Concussion Doc. Uh, as always, we have three questions this week. And also, if you can't watch us live on Instagram, Facebook, you can also watch us afterwards on YouTube. Uh, or you can listen to us on podcast uh, through uh, Apple iTunes or SoundCloud. So the first question we have today is, my son plays hockey and football. What helmets are the best? Now, we've done a few posts on this on Facebook, and we get this question quite a bit, actually. Um, and helmets uh, have not actually been shown to prevent uh, concussion. And the reason that is is that you have to understand first the biomechanics of how the actual concussion occurs. Uh, and for that, I'm actually going to draw on the whiteboard. So for those that are listening on podcasts, you might want to tune in on the YouTube video. So I'm going to draw a very rudimentary picture of a brain. Now there's two types of tissues inside the brain. Uh, well, it's actually the same tissue, but they're different densities. So what you have here are these, what's called axons, that go out from the inner part of the brain to the outer part of the brain. And what an axon looks like, if you guys can follow me here, you have a cell body and then these long kind of tails on an axon, okay? Now the cell bodies are located out here. The axons are deeper down, and then in here you get the deeper gray matter. So the outer part of the brain, which contains all the cell bodies, is called the gray matter. The inner part, which is lined by these little fat globules called myelin, is, and because fat is white, all of this tissue looks white. So you have two separate layers. You have gray matter and you have white matter. Now what a concussion actually is, they used to think it was the brain hitting the inside of the skull, creating a bruising of the brain. And then it would bounce back and hit the other part of the inside of the skull, creating kind of injury more to the gray matter. Now, more recent evidence is showing us that the injury is actually more of a deeper kind of white matter injury where it actually injures some of the deeper structures down in here. And the reason that is, is because the two tissue layers, gray matter and white matter, are different densities. So what a concussion actually is, is an acceleration or deceleration injury. So when an impact occurs and the brain moves back and forth, because these two tissues are accelerating and decelerating at different rates, you get this stretching where this tissue will pull up this way and stretch these axons. But also what will happen is the two layers of tissue will shear across each other, creating potentially some injury at the white matter, gray matter junction, and also some stretching of these axons. Now, why is that important? Okay. And th these axons actually don't break. So that's something important to kind of keep in mind is that you're not getting actual you know, damage to the axons where if, that's why imaging, when you look at MRIs and CT scans, don't necessarily show anything for concussion. But the stretching occurs nonetheless in the shearing. Now, why is that important? Well, over here, if we drill down to each individual axon, each individual brain cell, inside of the cell, you have a bunch of molecules. And on the outside of the cell, you have a bunch of different molecules. And for those therapists that are watching, what you actually have is a lot of potassium inside the cell, and you have a lot of sodium and calcium outside of the cell. So because of concentration gradients, things want to go from where there's a lot of it to where there's not a lot of it. So sodium and calcium want into the cell, potassium wants out. So if we look at this, we have these are all potassium. Out here you have sodium and calcium. Okay, that want in. Now, when that stretching and shearing occurs, the membrane of the neuron is actually made up of kind of um, a porous structure. And there's little voltage-gated channels on the neuron. Now, in a normal healthy brain, when uh, a signal comes in from one brain cell to the other, like this, these channels will open and stuff will flow out of their concentration gradients and this will change the composition of this neuron, which makes it excited, and then it fires, and it passes that signal to all the connecting tissue that it, that it connects with. Now, when a concussion injury happens, and we get this shearing force and this stretching force that happens with, with, within the brain, 
these channels that are closed actually become pulled open and the little porous membranes of the neuron get pulled open. And in that split second that things get pulled open, well, we have our concentration gradient. So potassium gets out, sodium and calcium come rushing in, the composition of the neuron gets changed, and therefore it gets excited and it fires. So really what you get with the concussion is an electrical storm that occurs. Now, if we think about what a helmet does, a helmet is out here, okay? Where's our football helmet here? Draw my little cage on here somehow. <laughs> Here's my cage. Okay, so we have your helmet wrapped around the brain. Now, it doesn't necessarily matter what you wrap around the brain because when that impact happens, the brain inside the skull is still moving. So you're gonna get that stretching and shearing that happens. Now, what a helmet is good for is if you get a direct impact force, if that was to your skull, you could potentially fracture your skull. But what a helmet does is when that force hits, it dissipates the force outwards and spreads out the surface area of the impact so that it's not as focal an impact. So if you were to picture, let's say, getting you know, a 90 mile an hour fastball to the side of your head, that ball hitting in such a small area puts your skull at risk for fracture. But wearing the helmet, when that ball hits that helmet, the force spreads out and dissipates so that your skull takes a, a wider area of that force and so that it, it, it prevents the skull from being fractured. But the force that hits the head and causes the head to whip back and forth, the brain inside the head is still moving. And that's where you get the stretching, the shearing, this ion exchange, and the, and the electrical storm that is the first phase of concussion injury. So this is the issue with helmets. Now helmets are designed to decrease the acceleration uh, of the, the force itself because there's padding inside the helmet so when a force hits it can slow it down. But studies on this that have actually looked for ways to slow it down have kind of fallen short. Um, there's a new helmet, at least in football, called the Vices Helmet, V-I-C-I-S, that they're studying now uh, in the NFL but there hasn't really been any research published on it, so I can't comment as to whether or not it will be effective at actually reducing concussion force. But the idea is that it's more of a softer shell helmet, so there's, there's more time um, to slow the force down. So um, that could potentially reduce the amount of acceleration, but again, there's no real uh, scientific research on these helmets yet, so we're not sure. In terms of hockey helmets, um, they're, they're all the same. You want something that has a good fit that's CSA approved, because remember, you're looking to prevent um, skull fractures, not necessarily concussions. Concussions can happen whether the hit is direct to the head. They can also happen if you just fall or get a hit in the body without even hitting your head because it's that whipping motion of the brain inside the skull that actually creates um, that concussion injury. So unfortunately, <laughs> the question uh, it can't be answered other than you want something that, that fits properly because uh, that actually has been shown proper helmet fit may be uh, helpful in, in uh, reducing concussion risk. Um, but you want something that is approved, uh, that fits well, uh, that has no cracks or defects, um, and, and that's really the best, your best bet. Okay, so that was a long, drawn-out answer, <laughs> but hopefully you get the picture. And those, again, that are, that are listening to this on podcast, uh, you can find the full video on YouTube, and you can see kind of what I've drawn behind me. Uh, number two. I visit the chiropractor and massage therapist regularly. Are there any other activities that are recommended? Um, I'm assuming this guy had a concussion as a patient. Um, so I'm not sure, sorry. But um, yeah, so chiropractic massage therapy, I mean, that's one component of what may help. Um, usually people, especially when you get into persistent symptoms, uh, for the most part, people that get a concussion, the symptoms are gonna go away within the first seven to you know 10, kind of 14 days. Uh, but People that generally need more therapy uh, in terms of other adjuncts are those people that have symptoms beyond kind of that 10 to 14 day period. Uh, and the, the causes of those persistent symptoms, there's a few kind of main causes. One of them is a blood flow issue uh, or a physiologic mechanism. There's metabolic, there's um, potentially um, inflammatory uh, issues that, that can cause some of those persistent symptoms. Um, cervical spine, which is where I think the, the chiropractor and massage therapist may be able to come in and lend a helping hand. But if that's all you're doing, um, and if that alleviates your symptoms, that's great. But 
there's a lot more to the concussion picture than just um, you know just manual therapy. And I think that's an important message to get across is that those things can help, but generally you need kind of more of a multidisciplinary approach with multiple professionals because um, like chiropractic massage, generally manual therapy, that's great, but you may need some vestibular work. You may need some vision therapy. You may need um, you know counseling. You may need uh, medication. You may need um, dietary supplements. It just all depends on what are the causes of your particular symptoms. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that could be potentially useful. I mean, I think the best bet is to find somebody that has training in all of these areas that can help to figure out the nuances, the ins and outs of what's actually contributing to your symptoms. Uh, because otherwise you end up with this professional that's saying this, this professional that's saying this, this other one who's saying this, and you need to try and kind of get everyone on the same page and, 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 and work together. And that's really where like kind of a network of different professionals can really be helpful because everyone's kind of on the same page. So there, to, to summarize, there's a lot of potential other activities that would be uh, recommended on top of Cairo and massage, uh, but those things can be uh, effective, particularly when you use um, everything else kind of together. Question about real question. <laughs> okay. Uh, from a, a athletic underscore, what are your thoughts on the mouth guard and prevention of concussion? Um, so that's that's another good question. I mean, it's been thought for a long time, and I'm not sure who kind of started this, um, but. The, the idea, and even when I played hockey when I was a kid, they, you know, you wore a mouth guard to prevent concussion. That was the whole thing. Um, and recently, uh, I mean, back in even the Zurich consensus statement, which was back in 2012, they said that uh, there's no evidence that mouth guards can um, protect against concussion or be preventative in any way. But because they can prevent dental injuries, you know, they're still a good idea to wear them. Recently, there was, uh, it was a meta-analysis that was done looking at all the studies on mouth guard use, and they did find that there was a, a potential slight reduction in concussion, and this was actually done by the University of Calgary. Uh, I think Carolyn Emery was the lead author on this, but it was a meta-analysis that was done, and they did find that there, there is a potential slight reduction in concussion risk while wearing a mouth guard. Uh, and they actually found no difference between the dental fitted ones uh, versus just kind of the boil and bite, you know, store bought, um, uh, less expensive ones. But the problem that with that study, although there showed a slight potential decrease in concussion risk while wearing a mouth guard, um, the confidence interval of that particular uh, finding actually crossed the zero line, meaning that it's not. Um, it's, it's not the best finding, right? If we had like a true, you know, where the full confidence interval was on one side of, of the line, uh, and that's just a kind of a statistical thing, that gives us some pretty strong evidence that it can be effective. This one, it was slightly across the line, and so uh, therefore uh, we still, I think, need a little bit more evidence on that to say that concussion can be prevented with a mouth guard. Uh, but again, can prevent dental injuries, should definitely be worn, always a good idea to have it. And if there is a side concussion benefit, then that's, then that's great. But I don't think we should be touting mouth guards as uh, reducing concussion risk necessarily, just based on the evidence that we have. Uh, third question, uh, my son plays football in an organization that mandated baseline testing. Should we be doing this? Okay, so hot topic, uh, a few varying ideas on this. Um, and I think that, you know what, actually to understand baseline testing and its importance, maybe I'll go back to my drawing board over here because I've already explained the first half of, of what concussion is. And I think that can kind of tie it back in. So. Remember that we had this acceleration, deceleration, where the nerves were stretched and pulled apart like that. So here's our neuron. It gets pulled apart, right? And remember when you have this ion exchange, it creates an action potential. So you get a series of action potentials that happen because when those action potentials happen, they pass those signals to the next neurons and so on and so on and so on. So you get this kind of electrical storm that happens in the brain. Now this is a very short duration Part, but this is phase one of the concussion injury. This is generally when you're going to get people that are off balance, people that are very confused, blank stare, potentially loss of consciousness. All the potential signs and symptoms of concussion may come about. You may have one, you may have several. Um, everyone's kind of different. 
So in the first phase, you get this electrical storm here, and people are going to present with any number of potential symptoms or a few kind of key signs. Now, all of this kind of calms down, and generally within the next 10 to 15 minutes, most athletes are like, no, no, I feel good now, I feel fine, I feel fine. And that's because this first electrical phase is kind of over. So this is called the excitatory phase of concussion. But what happens over the next few hours to days is they get this massive drop in energy, and that's ATP. So I'm gonna draw this kind of chart here. And over here, you have ATP, which is the energy molecule, uh, which is all your cell processes. You kind of drop, 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 drop. You hit your peak low kind of around like day five to day seven, somewhere in there. We're not really sure what the exact kind of peak low point is. And then you start regaining your energy back up, and then you flatten out here, and then that's kind of the full recovery. Now, the, what we know with concussion and what's been studied a few in a, in, a, in a bunch of animal studies is that this process for an animal is about a five-day kind of process. And what they wanted to know um, in this one particular study is if we were to hit them at different time points during the recovery and give them a second injury, what would the outcome be of that particular event? And so they found that when they hit the animals after their full metabolic recovery, there was no additive or cumulative effect to the concussions. It just acted as, a, as another kind of independent concussion event. They went through the same kind of process, same kind of recovery period. Now, when they hit the animals in the middle of their recovery, well, then they dropped way down here. And in fact, some of the animals died because of that. And then the other ones who didn't die had a massive, massive drop in their ATP levels down to what would be considered akin to more severe brain injury. So a concussion is a mild brain injury, but two concussions back to back or two concussions while you're still recovering from the first can cause a massive, massive issue, potentially a fatal issue, and at the very least, a long, long recovery and more serious possible damage. Now, the problem with concussion is that the symptoms kind of get worse and worse and worse over those first few days, right? And then people turn this corner and they start to feel better. And so oftentimes the symptoms go away around that seven to 10 day mark. And the human studies that have been done and looked at this found that this can take anywhere from three to maybe even five or six weeks to recover here. The problem is most of us are using just a symptom-based approach. Where are your symptoms? Well, my symptoms are gone. Okay, well then, you know, your doctor will sign off on your letter and return you to play. The scary part is that this entire period of time, even though you feel 100% better, there's still risk for these subsequent concussions that can be additive and cumulative. The whole point of concussion management and proper concussion care is to try and get people to this point so that they're not only recovered from a symptomatic standpoint, but they're also recovered from a physiologic standpoint. And there's ways that we can do that. And one of them is exertional testing, right? So we incorporate exertional testing, specific tests into our return to play. So just because your symptoms go away, I don't really care. You need more than that, right? Now you start the return to play process. There's exertional testing and everything like that. Now, the big concern over baseline testing, and people will say on the side that's against baseline testing, is that it's unnecessary. We don't need a baseline testing because the best results we have are the symptoms, okay? Well, you don't need a baseline to make your concussion diagnosis, and I think that's where people go wrong, right? They will pitch this as a way to tell, you know, schools and sports organizations that this will tell us if there's been a concussion or not. But in fact, some recent studies have found that the best indicator was just the presence of symptoms. So we don't need a baseline, right? It's unnecessary because the people that are against baseline testing don't are, are thinking that it's being used uh, to make a diagnosis, and a lot of people are using it for that. And that's where baseline testing uh, gets a little bit controversial, because the symptom score here will make your initial diagnosis. The problem is here. How do we know when the person is kind of safe to go back and play? And this is where having some objectivity in your in your assessments can be really helpful. The other issue, if you look at, let's say, just a SCAP, which is like a standard baseline assessment um, tool that people use, but it's meant for sideline care. It's meant in the immediate phase. And actually, 
we have to look at when things normalize. So if we look at the scat, okay, the best thing on the scat, and this was recently found at a, a study out of York, the best thing on the scat in the acute phase was the symptom scale. Okay, so again, scat, the tests that are in there, the best, the concentration, the memory, if anything, they're marginally good at the initial phase. And then if you look at when does it normalize? Well, within three to four days, the scat, the balance portion, the memory, the concentration has been shown to be back to normal. So is the scat a good tool to be making a return to play decision that you're trying to make three to four weeks later? No, because the scat will normalize before the symptoms even go away. So if you're just doing a scat as your baseline, then yeah, not very effective. Okay? But it can potentially help in the initial phase, but most of the time you don't need it. Let's look at something else. Let's look at neurocognitive testing. So computerized neurocognitive testing, this is another big one that people use. Well, first of all, if somebody comes in complaining of symptoms, blurred vision, dizziness, all that stuff, putting them in front of a computer is unnecessary. We don't need to do that because all it's going to do is say, yeah, they have a concussion. We already knew that based on they had a mechanism of injury and symptom onset. So again, baseline testing in this phase is not where it's important. But if we look at back here, that's when maybe having a baseline neurocognitive test to understand what that person's pre-injury status was can help us when we're determining, okay, this person's passed all the stuff, they've been asymptomatic, they're back at school, they've been back to practice. Let's just double check and see, are there any additional you know, issues or impairments that may be present? Now the big concern over these types of tests are that there's a test retest reliability question. Test retest reliability, you want a measure to be stable. So if I test you today and I test you three weeks from now and I test you six months from now, you want that measure to be stable across the board. The problem with these neurocognitive tests is that they have questionable or low to moderate test retest reliability. So this test by itself, no good. So when people knock baseline testing, they're using studies that test one test at a time, right? Well, this study looked at neurocognitive testing, found that it had questionable test retest reliability. So therefore, the concept of baseline testing is bad. Well, no, that's not necessarily true, okay? All we know now is that this test by itself is bad. So we need more, okay? What else do you want to look at? You want to look at postural sway. Okay? Right? We already looked at SCAT and we looked at the BESS, which is kind of an easy clinical measure of balance, but that normalizes three days after injury. So BESS, you know, you can use it potentially for your sideline test, your quick clinical test, but three to four weeks later when you're trying to make a return to play decision, it's not going to help you. But if you look at postural sway, meaning looking at force plates, looking at things like center of pressure area, medial lateral displacement, gait, different things like that. The normalization for this stuff, 30 days plus, okay? A good long-term outcome measure that can help you when you're looking 30 days plus. That's how long that takes to normalize. So now if you take neurocognitive plus postural sway, now let's look at other stuff. Vestibular, visual, whatever else. King Devic test, okay? Mixed results on King Devic so far, but uh, most, for the most part, the majority of studies show that right immediately at the sideline, there's about a five second drop in overall King Devic score. So that's a, that's a good test because it's pretty sensitive to the injury itself, whether or not it's specific or there are other things that could cause that King Devic score to drop. I would argue, oh well it's better to be on the side of being cautious than not, right? And some studies have found that King Devic has good longevity, where even three, four, five, six weeks later, people are still showing deficits in the King Devic test score. Okay, great. So now we're developing a picture. We got this, we got this, we got this, and now putting these together will improve your reliability, will improve your validity. And remember, these are not to make a decision. You're not gonna just hang your hat on what the tests say. You're a clinician. You're using the tools that you have, right? Your clinical exam, your neurological screening, your physical exertion testing, talking to the parents, talking to the teachers, talking to the coaches, and also a lot of this, other, there's more in here too, I'm just saying, there's more in here. But if you have a comprehensive battery of tests, that gets rid of a lot of the problems with test retest reliability. 
right? If you were to take any one of these tests as an individual entity, it would suck. It falls flat on its face. So if you were to look at, let's say, a diagnosis of cancer, you're not going to diagnose somebody with cancer just, just based on a blood test, right? A blood test may show something. Then you go, okay, well, now we have to go further. Let's get a CT scan. Oh, CT scan shows something as well. Okay, now let's get a biopsy, right? And there's levels of tests that you get to to finally arrive at your diagnosis of what ultimately is cancer. So it's the same thing with concussion. You're not going to diagnose concussion or base your entire decision on one test, right? But when you have a battery of tests and they're all showing you the same thing, that's when it can be effective to have something like that. Because, and actually there's a study that was just done on this that looked at like normative data, right? That's another argument against baseline testing. Well, we have norms, but what's normal? What's normal? The range of normal is actually so wide for cognitive function that the, a recent study found that the, the King Dive was only useful if it was compared to somebody's pre-injury baseline score. So the idea of baseline is not to use it as a diagnostic tool, and that's not what it should be used for. Okay? If you understand what's happening with concussion, baseline testing shouldn't just be one test. Okay? It needs to be a comprehensive battery of tests that all have these thoughts in mind. What's the longevity? What is the test retest reliability? How does it improve? We also have a reaction time test. Uh, there was just a study on that to show that it was actually extremely reliable, high, high, high reliability, okay? And, and good validity. So there you go. So now you put these together, and now you have a better picture of what can be a good baseline battery, and now you know when to apply it. It's after all the symptoms have gone away, after they've returned to school, after they've been back uh, practicing in a non-contact way with their sports, uh, after you've done physical exertion testing, uh, after you've put them through the ringer on everything, now you go, all right, one final test, let's do all of this stuff. So baseline testing can never be hurtful. It can never clear someone earlier than what they would normally be cleared for because they still have to go through the entire process. It can only ever help to make sports a little bit safer. It can only ever help to hold somebody back a little bit longer, right? And there, there's, there's potential reliability issue. Well, maybe we're holding back people that don't need to be held back. That's the only problem with this scenario. Because in any other world, if we didn't have it, we'd be clearing them here, right? Or we'd be clearing them here maybe, okay? So if we have it, it only can help to make better, safer decisions. So my son plays football in an organization that mandated baseline. Should we be doing this? Well, A, you have to also think about the age. Okay, baseline testing has not been validated for people of younger ages, so they should be kind of in that middle school, high school age before you're even considering doing that. You shouldn't be doing baseline testing on a six-year-old just because uh, the tests are kind of complex and kids don't often understand. But once you get into the older ranges, as long as they can understand why they're doing the test, what the test is for, uh, and you make sure the clinicians doing it uh, have a good understanding and have training in, in how to do it, how to administer it, uh, then I am a firm believer that um, this is the, the safest way to um, potentially prevent this second impact scenario, this second um, thing, because without it, you, you don't really have anything, right? So it's only adding more to your clinical picture, uh, and that's why um, I think that Yes, you should be doing it, but there should be other things considered, such as age, tests, how many tests are included, right? Is it just a computer test? If so, then no, you're going to the wrong place. Um, but yeah, you have to make sure that who's doing it has a good understanding of what it is. So those are our three questions. I think we were a little bit longer than we typically are. But uh, uh, again, those who are listening that couldn't see my drawings and everything else, uh, you can find us on YouTube. Um, and keep the questions coming. Um, we like doing this, so uh, we'll see you guys next time we do it. Thank you.